My guest today is Catherine Martin. Along with her husband and creative partner, Baz Luhrmann, Catherine has created some of the most fabulous and memorable images in Australian film. From the sequins and feathers in Strictly Ballroom to Nicole Kidman's red gown in Moulin Rouge, the flapper dresses of The Great Gatsby, and now the new Elvis movie, which brings to Technicolor life Elvis's whole world, the blues joints of Beale Street, Graceland with its peacock-stained glass windows and custom-built six-metre sofa, and of course, the iconic costumes of the king himself, the hair, the capes and the outrageously sexy black leather suit he wore for his 1968 comeback special. Catherine has so far won four Oscars for her costume and production design. That's more Oscars than any other Australian. And when she won for The Great Gatsby, Catherine said she was taking inspiration from another great Australian film, The Castle, and that her Oscar was going straight to her and Baz's pool room. Hi, Catherine. Hi, how are you? Very well. Do you really have a pool room somewhere where you keep all of these awards you keep getting? Not really, but it's a dream. (laughs) Maybe it'll happen one day. When it comes to your new movie, Telling the Life of Elvis Presley, a man whose look is so famous, I mean, where do you start as a production and, and costume designer? Well, it starts with Baz, who will have a vision and an idea of how he wants to tell the story. And he will set a number of research tasks during the process of writing the script. And the script usually starts with the treatment, which is a 40-page or whatever number page it ends up being, synopsis or a, a longer synopsis that kind of draws out what the story that's going to be told in the movie. And we start to do research that will help and flesh out. For instance, we did an enormous chart of every jumpsuit Elvis <laughs> ever wore in chronological order. <laughs> How many uh, is that, where... can I ask? How many jumpsuits? Oh, look, it's in the 30s, I would wow. say. And, you know, we sort of listed where he'd worn them, if there were any anecdotes about the jumpsuits. <sighs> Just so that Baz had a resource to be able to use that within the script writing process. And then we start to collectively make a book which illustrates the treatment and eventually the script. And it starts off with historical images, documentary images that tell the story through pictures and we use this to express to the studio the way that Baz wants to tell the story to actors and this document just gets bigger (laughs) and more detailed and the documentary images start to be swapped out for costume sketches and concept boards and eventually we kind of have a document that it gives you a touch point to all of the visual things that appear in the movie. And before we shoot, Baz always does a table read with all the cast. And at that point, we also do a design presentation. There's always an audience, some people from the studio, some heads of department that come and see this. And it's a way of all coming together and kind of being all on the same artistic track. Elvis went through such distinctive styles across his life, Catherine. Was there a period that was the most enjoyable to recreate or reimagine? Not really. They all had their challenges and their pleasurable parts, so to speak. I think there were two watershed moments in the design process of the costumes. I think one of them was the black leather blues on and pants Mm -hmm. that Elvis wore in the 68 special. And it was one of the first scenes we shot. And as a result, we really focused on that costume, not only because it was iconic, because always with leather, there are technical difficulties just because of the material you're using and also the manufacturing time. So 
We started working on this costume and poor Austin has suffered greatly <laughs> at our hands in the fitting room. <laughs> what did and you do to him to get him into that black leather? Just hours of <laughs> fiddling about, you know, starting with calico toiles, which is you make a shape in fabric to kind of get the proportions. And then we went through many leather our iterations to find exactly the right leather that moved correctly. But I think the most important thing that we discovered, Baz, Austin and I, was it was a conceptual perspective, which was if we tried to make Elvis's historical clothes exactly as they appeared in inverted commas reality, the costumes lost something. They became kind of like Halloween costumes. Mm. And it was really important to synthesise Austen's interpretation of Elvis's character with the costume. I mean, there's only one Elvis and unfortunately he's passed. So it needed to be Austen bringing the humanity of Elvis, manifesting that part of Elvis. And they were very subtle changes, but the costume needed to intersect with Austin's physicality. So it was just the height of the collar, maybe the scale of the pockets, the length of the jacket, and it also needed to intersect with the rigours of filmmaking. So we had a number of different pants, you know, sitting pants, standing pants, dancing pants that served different technical things. So the sitting <laughs> pants need to be longer because I never like seeing socks or the tops of boots when people sit down. <laughs> we wanted the ability to have the standing pants be absolutely immaculate, but the dancing pants always were a bit stretched out at the knee. They needed to be bigger at the knee because Austin needed knee pads because he did all of the falling to his knees and thrusting his pelvis into the eagerly awaiting fans <laughs> over and over again. So structurally and technically, they needed to be slightly different to accommodate those technical nuances. Oh, that's so interesting. And your young Elvis, Catherine, is is quite feminine looking. I don't know if that is historically accurate or if that's one of the places that you played with the character that Austin as an actor was bringing, those lace shirts and pink suits. is almost an androgynous look to, to that Elvis in that stage of his life. Well, Elvis is famously known for the combination of black and pink. And Elvis also wore lace shirts. And Elvis also raided his mother's makeup drawer and dyed his hair from blonde to black. So Elvis throughout his career created personas and I think it was because he was actually inherently shy and Elvis always suffered from stage fright throughout his career. So I think it was kind of his carapace or mm. stage persona that allowed him to basically overcome all of these fears. Did he have a whole team of people behind the scenes, the real Elvis, in, in creating those incredible looks like the 30-something jumpsuits? Well, there were people that made the jumpsuits, but the stylistic impetus always came from Elvis himself. I mean, he didn't have a stylist. So it was very much about, I think, discovery for him and experimentation. So in terms of the jumpsuits... On the 68 special, he worked with the NBC costume designer, Bill Ballou. And Bill Ballou, I believe, came up with what has become known as the Napoleon collar. So it's the collar we know in the jumpsuit, in the black leather suit. So the high collar, the standing that up. high collar that framed Elvis's face. And that collar, Elvis recognised as... Um, a key style moment for him. It was a signature look. And he kept working with Bill Ballou after the 68 special. And it was his collaboration with Bill Ballou that brought about the jumpsuits. So he would take things that existed in inverted commas, but change them so that they became absolutely unmistakably his. Mm. 
What about the character of Priscilla Presley, who in the film is played by the Australian actress Olivia de Jong? What was your approach to her look and, and how it changed over the years? I mean, Priscilla, who's still alive, is a, an incredible style icon and also someone who is kind of interesting because her story really parallels women's journeys in the 20th century from the 50s through till the you know current day. So she starts off basically as a classic young 50s girl who's very much part of a household and under the wing of a man and eventually she does create her own destiny and I think that she would agree that she really becomes her own person and takes the reins of her own life. And so in the movie, I know that Olivia, and I think she does this incredibly successfully, she wanted to show that Priscilla had great agency in her life and she wasn't just this passive person. Like what attracted Elvis to her in the first place? And I think there's a marvellous scene when they're still in Germany where you see her vivaciousness, her interesting way of looking at the world, her strength and her agency, I keep using mm. that word, but I, I really mean that she's looking forward. And I think it was important to, exactly like with Elvis, not just slavishly copy and do bad imitations of Priscilla's clothes, but find a way of connecting a contemporary audience to her style in a really visceral way. So we chose to collaborate again with Mutra Prada and use archival pieces that were adapted for the film. They were all custom made for Olivia. It was fantastic because when you work with Prada, you just have access to such extraordinary fabric technology. You have access to all their atelier that can do beautiful beading work and you can create complete looks because they can make shoes and gloves and so you can consider the looks as totalities and then there were just some strict recreations like the wedding dress or there's the final scene with Elvis and Priscilla on a tarmac and they're both wearing the clothes that they wore walking out of the divorce court hand in hand. So it was about creating a landscape that allowed Priscilla to grow in her control of the situation. And when she leaves Elvis, she does wear pants earlier in the movie, but in that 70s period and when she loses, as she leaves Elvis, when she's taking control, she's really striding out in a pair of strides into her own life. And that was a deliberate choice. How nervous were you, Catherine, about meeting the real Priscilla? Incredibly nervous, as was Baz and, of course, Olivia, who didn't meet Priscilla till Khan. I think the most nervous moment, Baz has said publicly, the most nervous of his filmmaking career, the most stressful audience screening was to Priscilla and Jerry Schilling. And he had to be on a plane while the screening was going on. And he says he was just completely beside himself. And the great relief when the Presley family really embraced the movie. And I know Priscilla has said publicly, if my husband was around, he would have said, hot damn, <laughs> um, Austin is me. That's a great relief. The home that Elvis and Priscilla lived in, his mansion, Graceland, that itself is such an important part of the visual myth of, of Elvis. What made the biggest impression on you the first time you walked into Graceland? I'd always had this vision that it would be 
sort of ginormous and it was smaller than I imagined. Not disappointing, but just smaller. But I think that brings humanity to Elvis because this house in his life was something he bought for his mother. It was a symbol of his success in his early career. And I think it was very much a part of his kind of tethered connection to a home life and a home. And that scale of house really represents, I think, that humanity. And it was just kind of really moving to be in his parents' room downstairs, to be allowed to kind of look around the house in detail when no one else was there. You know, you get to feel a presence of the man and he really was the style instigator in the house and that gives you a sense of who he was as a person. What, what kind of sense do you get of him from seeing the way he decorated Graceland? I think he had a sense of showmanship and luxury and a desire to keep up with the times. And he has a lot of, in inverted commas, living rooms, whether it's the music room or his white living room upstairs or the bar and television room downstairs that we didn't show in the movie but that's has a yellow vinyl upholstered bar, the jungle room. It's got green shag carpet on the on the ceiling, I think. Yes, and we actually <laughs> built the jungle room, but it didn't make the cut. Oh, my God. Um, the billiard room. And I think that this speaks to Elvis's entourage and the lasting friendships that he made throughout his life and the community he created that, really came from his Memphis beginnings and the idea that he was really constantly surrounded and engaged in social settings. That six-metre sofa that I think he ordered almost straight away after moving into Graceland, was that a challenge to, to reproduce? It was not only a challenge to reproduce for Bev Dunn, my set decorator, but it was a challenge to get into the set. <laughs> and we were all like, how did Elvis? Because all the proportions of Graceland that we built were all absolutely accurate from measurements we actually took in the house and from blueprints that I think that Graceland actually had in the archive. And we just were like, how did he get it into the house? I mean, it was like a 55-point turn <laughs> to get it in. So we have absolutely no idea how he got it into the house, apart from with great difficulty <laughs> and exactly how we did. <laughs> Catherine, how far back in your life do you, do you remember noticing the way things looked and, and taking care and, and attention to, say, clothes and, and your, your visual setting? I mean, that's a really interesting question. I know that until the age of five, I would only wear shoes that were red coloured. I obviously had some kind of visual obsession. We've now all discovered in latter life that, you know, through therapy, that um, the entire family have some kind of obsessive compulsive disorder. So I think that that served me very well in my career where I become obsessed with detail and extremely distracted if there's anything like things drive me crazy like cords, not only in my own house but on set, like I don't like seeing which is part of everyday yeah, life. I was going to say, movie sets, I imagine, crazy. have a lot of cords on, on a movie well, set. Well, not on my set. <laughs> How do you hide you know, them? What's your strategy? Well, you know, I accept that people who are filming <laughs> and sound recorders need cords, but I find it just when it's random, like sometimes you really do need cords, like in the 68 special, obviously 
the cameras need to have cords or guitars need to have cords because it's kind of weird. But it's just those things in domestic settings where it just feels incongruous or ugly. I like to have them tucked away. So I think I've always loved art and looking at paintings and being in historical buildings and looking at historical clothes. I remember loving the V&A. My auntie Pat, I think, took me to the V&A for the first time when I must have been six or seven. And just loving those objects that describe social history, clothes and accessories and all the ephemera of life that describe what life is like, interiors and toasters. And I also remember going to the powerhouse a lot and loving that aspect, you know, being able to see radiators in the shape of the Harbour Bridge. (laughs) And just the fact that all that ephemera and clothing reflect how people really lived and what their obsessions were and the social mores and how people like to be perceived and all the quirky detail that reflects people's interesting psychology. How did your grandmother Kathleen introduce you to vintage fashion? Well, my grandmother was a staunch Presbyterian and very involved with the social activities of the church everything from making posies to flower arranging in the church and morning teas were a big part of her life. (laughs) And um, one of the fundraising activities every year for the church was this historical fashion parade. And I used to look forward to it every year because I just loved looking at the clothes and I loved the glamour and the romance of the past. I'm sure, you know, my grandmother was very scientific. She was one of the first women to graduate from the sciences at Sydney University. So she was very logical, very cut and dried. She had a great eye for colour and for gardening and flowers, but she was a very, you know... (sighs) Not humorless in a mean way, but um, my father has a great sense of humour, as did her husband, my Australian grandfather. But grandma was one of those people. We loved the goodies and all the ridiculous, you know, English humour of the 70s. And my grandmother would say, this is completely silly. I don't know what you're laughing at. (laughs) And we would just, that would make us laugh even more. Because we were like, really? And so I'm not sure she noticed the glamour of the fashion parade and I'm sure she was much more focused on the supper that was happening afterwards and the fundraising. But I, I remember that distinctly as something that I just found extraordinary. And how did you first learn to sew? Who taught you? My mother taught me to sew. I asked to use the sewing machine. It was kind of a robin's egg blue singer sewing machine. It must have been a late 60s or 70s kind of model. And she taught me to sew. And very patiently, I might add. And she was... uh, I remember her telling me when I kind of cut out T-shirt shapes for my dolls and I wasn't happy with the fit under the arm because they kind of got all wrinkly. And she said to me, well, that's because you haven't cut an armhole. And I always, armholes have always been a struggle for me. That's something John Galliano was brilliant at, was an armhole. But that's always escaped me. Thank God I have a team who were brilliant at armholes. <laughs> well, you're talking to a person who just used to staple clothes together for her dolls. So already you're on a whole other level, Catherine, even at that age. Your, your mother is French and your father Australian. How did they meet one another? They met in Paris at the Sorbonne at a university, I don't know whether the word is hostel, but basically university accommodation. And I believe they were were neighbours. In French you say that they were on the same palier, which means on the same floor, 
you know, wherever around the stairs. And they may have also had mutual friends, English speaking friends that kind of brought them together. But yes, it was a university love story. My mother was studying modern mathematics, but it obviously has skipped a generation and it's even <laughs> skipped a further generation because my children are hopeless at maths. My brother, however, is a statistician, so he obviously he got took. some genes. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he is a medical statistician and writes and interprets drug studies. So he is, he's the brainy one who can add up. Unfortunately, somehow that skipped all of us. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. You can hear more Conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Catherine, your parents met at the Sorbonne in Paris. What was your dad doing there? He was doing his doctorate. He won the university medal in his year. And as a result, he got a scholarship and passage to France. I think it was in 58 that he went to France for the first time. And it was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with France and Paris he describes arriving in England and that having been built up in his childhood because we were still very much in the mindset, I think, in Australia in the late 50s that the mother country was, of course, the UK. And he arrived in Trafalgar Square and was slightly disappointed that it wasn't as big as he had imagined. And he describes arriving in Paris and it being better than he had imagined. <laughs> Is he still a scholar? Yes. He's 86 and he still spends four hours a day writing his bibliography. He has been writing for 50 years. His other colleagues who <laughs> contributed largely have since passed, but he continues to write for four hours a day this bibliography. He says the work will never be finished and he's always extremely guilty if he doesn't put the four oh hours goodness. in. What's the subject of this grand ongoing bibliography? It is allegedly the definitive bibliography of the 18th century French novel. So he has been collecting and documenting this from early 70s, late 60s, I believe. And of course, it all started with going to the library and actually looking up the card catalogue. He's very proud of the library card he has at the Bibliothèque Nationale because it allows him to take out a large number of books. So he used to have to travel to France and actually sit in libraries and do the research. But now with the internet, just every day he discovers a new edition or a new novel that isn't documented in this opus. Your your mum, as you say, was studying maths and her father was a doctor. How did he come to study medicine, Catherine? My grandfather's parents were butler and a lady's maid. My great-grandmother came from a sewing background. She'd been a petite main, which is somebody that does all the hand sewing in a couture atelier, and she'd been doing that in Paris. Her husband got a job as a butler in one of the big Jewish households in Paris, and she came on as the lady's maid because she was so good at repairing clothes and all that kind of stuff. So my grandfather was very bright, and every time he did well at school or won a prize or came top of his class, this family would always give uh, him prize money and they really supported him to go to medical school. He studied radiology at the Curie Institute in Paris. He was always made misogynistic remarks about Curie because he said that she pushed I don't remember the, exactly the story, but she pushed her husband under a bus or a tram or horse-drawn carriage, I can't remember. 
and then took all the credit for everything he did, <laughs> which everyone would roll their eyes at the table <laughs> going, oh, I don't think that's entirely true. But yes, I think she was still alive when he went to medical wow. school. And did you know him, Catherine? Was he still alive when, when you were a little girl? Yes, he loomed large in my life. He was an extraordinarily eccentric character, super smart. His idea of rest and relaxation or a hobby was doing complicated mathematical equations in his study. And as a child, I just used to go, how could that even vaguely, you know, be pleasurable? But he, I think, had wanted to be you know, some kind of whiz-bang academic mathematician trying to solve the mysteries of the universe by adding up. He ended up being a doctor because that seemed to be a path out of, you know, his background. He, ca he came from, as he referred to them, the peasant classes and then certainly the working class and certainly the serving class. And I think he saw being a doctor a way out of this into the middle class or the upper middle class. He was also, and maybe this is where I get my obsession with home renovating and home renovating shows, he obsessively tried to do his own home renovation, particularly electrical work. <laughs> and so it meant that he used to condemn entire floors <laughs> in the house and we weren't allowed to go there. He bought quite an extraordinary house in my mother's natal town, Nevers. It was a beautiful Art Deco mansion built by an Argentinian millionaire, allegedly, who had had a nurse in the First World War who came from this town and she wanted to be able to go back and see her family there. So he built three identical houses, one in Buenos Aires, one in Puritz <laughs> and one in Nevers. And he bought this house after the war. He had five children and it was truly spectacular. It had a lift. It had a winding marble staircase that went around the lift shaft and it had entire floors that were condemned because <laughs> he electronics. had tried to, to rewire <laughs> and everyone would beg him not to touch anything, but he couldn't help himself. And he thought that, like, he was certainly wealthy enough to hire an electrician. So all of us are very confused as to why he felt it was his job to do this. Maybe that's where your horror of chords comes from. What car did he have or did he create there in the Loire Valley? So after my grandfather, he was a prisoner of war. He was captured by the Germans and it was his lifelong kind of romance with all things American and he loved Nescafe and packet American goods because they would come in Red Cross packages. And he thought it was the height of technology. So after the war, he decided he wanted an American Jeep. So he bought a surplus Jeep. I'm not sure from where in Europe. And he had all the parts posted to him. Posted? In the yes. <laughs> strange, I know. <laughs> Very strange. And it was all put together back in Nevers. And I remember as a child, and they say before I was born, he used to drive around in this Jeep in the same outfit. He used to wear, he was tall for a Frenchman. So he was just over six foot tall and he would wear the equivalent of blue King G bib and brace overalls, <laughs> a flannelette shirt. The bib and brace overalls, because I think they were made for average French people, <laughs> were always a bit short, black socks and sort of Jesus sandals. <laughs> and Did not expect that. And this would be his outfit that he would relax at home in. <laughs> Obviously, when he went to be a doctor at the hospital, he did wear a shirt and tie and a suit jacket, but he would relax at home in this rather eccentric outfit, <laughs> ready to do his electrical <laughs> That's work. That's right. So it was in Paris that your parents fell in love. How did they look on their, on their wedding day? Catherine, what's your mother wearing? Oh, my mother is wearing the best dress ever, which I think in my teenagehood I cut up. Oh, I'm so oh, embarrassed to say no. this because my daughter would absolutely love it. 
So it was the 60s and it was incredibly short. So it was very trendy, you know, mini skirt, but like below the knee, a completely full skirt with petticoats, very slim waisted. My mother was tiny. It was a sleeveless dress with a high round neckline, but it had this fabulous cropped jacket that went over the top. So in the church, she didn't have bare shoulders and arms and she had a short veil. And I was very shocked as a child because I related it to the Munsters or the Adams family. She carried what I referred to as death lilies, but they were calla lilies, like just very simply a few lilies. And my father wore a very dapper black suit and Buddy Holly glasses. <laughs> um, and my mother wore cat eye glasses to her wedding too. But she was really quite glamorous, Mum, and stylish when she was young. My father remembers this. And just recently, my mother broke her leg and was in hospital for a period of time. And now she's, you know, obviously 86, so her sartorial splendour is diminished somewhat. But we all laughed because she was going to rehabilitation and she loves pleats, please, which is isimiyaki, and that's what she gets for Christmas and birthdays. <laughs> so when she went to her rehabilitation exercises in the class, she went in her pleats, please outfit... <laughs> And she remarked that everybody in the class was very badly dressed <laughs> and she was quite disappointed. And I said, Mum, they were in workout outfits. You were in your pleats, please, which seems really inappropriate for that setting. But she was just outraged. So how did your father convince your mother to leave France and come to Australia? Well, I think it was a love story. She wanted to follow my father. He promised her family that he would bring her back every second year. And he kept that, you know, solemn promise. My brother and I ended up being able to speak and understand French because that was the language that was spoken at home. So we had a relatively Francophile, you know, upbringing. And yeah, my father is... He's actually in France right now, tripping around with my mother's French family right now, going to visit everybody on a road trip. My mother adores her family, but really sees herself as an Australian now. And it's my father who has the French passport. What kind of culture shock was Australia and the suburbs of Sydney for your mum, do you think? Look, I think it was incredibly difficult. I think it affected her mental health a lot. My mother has struggled with mental health all her life. My father knew about this before he married her. And I think that her mother was a depressive and I've had episodes of depression in my life. And, you know, my father's anxious. We're all terribly anxious family. And I think for her to be completely isolated and only have my father's family who didn't really understand the different mores that she had or her experience, I think it was extremely difficult and the isolation would have been terrible. She didn't speak English. You know, she could say hello and goodbye and she learnt English by watching the television. It was a huge culture shock. She just has described to me that when she came here, all of Australia, she felt, was dressed in what she terms tablier. Tablier are sort of aprons, but they're more like smocks that children wear over their clothes to school. And because they're meant to protect your clothes, they're pretty unglamorous, you know. <laughs> and so... I think she just, and she sticks out of family photos, you know, at Christings of our extended family. I remember my mother in the photo wearing a leopard print hat. And this would have been before I was born, probably just before she fell pregnant with me. And I have an incredible love of leopard print. So maybe my mother passed that on to me. But I think, yes, it, I think it affected her. The isolation really affected her mental health. And, you know, she's had various mental health crises during her life. And I think that 
the one that happened after my brother's birth, I'm sure, was exacerbated not only by the birth but also by the kind of mounting pressure of this isolation. Mm. As a little girl, were you aware of that or is that something that's become clearer to you as, as an adult? No. In my family, we always spoke about it because my mother had had a kind of mental breakdown in her final year of school and she'd been taken out of school and had gone and had psychoanalysis in Paris. So because my grandfather was a doctor, he was pretty enlightened about mental health and it was always talked about and never hidden. I remember as a very small child being pretty freaked out about my mother being in bed at home for an extended period of time. But it was always dealt with. And I, as I'm getting older, I talk about it more and more because I think that the other thing my mother suffered from here was the taboo associated with mental health. And she'd been in a situation where people acknowledged it and people acknowledged her mother's illness. And I think it was very difficult that her illness, it, it just wasn't acknowledged and it was a great taboo. And I think, you know, as part of my mother's legacy, I think it's really important that we talk about the fact that this is something that so many people suffer from. And particularly after COVID, within our family, my immediate family, one of my children, myself, we suffered in terms of our mental health as so many other people did. I mean, we're certainly not alone. Mm. And um, I just think it's really important to talk about and not be embarrassed. People aren't embarrassed saying that they're a diabetic and mental illness is a chemical imbalance in the brain. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. So you grew up in, in the suburbs and eventually after school ended up at NIDA. Did it feel like you'd found your tribe there? Oh, absolutely. I really, and I still feel like this today, it's not a job, it's kind of a vocation. You know, I don't want to undermine people who have a religious vocation. I know that that's traditionally the term used for that. But I certainly found a profound connection with what I do. And some days it's really difficult to go to work, but that everybody has that. But I never wake up thinking or feeling confused about my direction or what I want to do. And I love what I do. You know, it really defines me. And there's such great pleasure. I find great pleasure in doing it. Yeah, I just find it incredibly satisfying. It's particularly satisfying when you're in the zone and it's less um, mental and conceptual, which is really important, but it's kind of, it becomes like a physical act. You know, if I'm draping on a dummy or whatever and I'm just, I'm sort of one, it sounds so corny, but I'm one with the fabric and I'm feeling the garment and I'm thinking about the person and it's just this kind of, it doesn't happen all the time, but when you're doing it, it, it must be what it feels like when you're a tennis player and believe you me, I'm scared of the ball and have no <laughs> hand-to-eye coordination. But it, yeah, it must be like when you're doing this volley and it just keeps going um, and it, it is, it sounds sort of weird and like I'm being a bit strange, but it is a, a physical pleasure that it's like in your body, that feeling of just being in the zone. How did you first meet uh, an up and coming film director called Baz Luhrmann? I met him when he interviewed me for a job. It was the bicentennial year and he had got a grant to make an opera with the Australian Opera, and um, he'd also got a company, a sort of satellite company with the Sydney Theatre Company. And I went to a job interview, thought I was late, but I wasn't. He'd gone for a swim with Craig Pearce, who still works with him now, and they terrified me. They snuck up on me. What did you wear, Catherine, to that 
to that first meeting? Oh, I made an outfit which was like high-waisted linen wide leg pants, black, and a cropped green and black kind of Chanel-inspired jacket. And what were your first impressions of him? I mean, how quickly did it feel like there was a connection in in your creativity? Oh, immediately. Like, we were interested in the same things. I think intellectually it was a breath of fresh air because he thought so profoundly about things. But not only that, he thought outside the box, you know, beyond the norm, And I don't want to big note myself in any way, but I'd always felt like I thought differently to other people, not better, just differently. And I used to sit in rooms and think, really? Oh, I don't think of it like that. Which led to a sense of teenage isolation because, you know, when you think differently, you are a bit of an outsider and it was just a relief to have someone who didn't think exactly like me but had that same kind of slightly, not offbeat, but out of the, like, it was refreshing to speak to somebody who thought out of the box. Were you as ambitious as he was? I think people at school would have thought I was very ambitious and I think I am ambitious. Um, I've also been described as opportunistic and I don't know whether that's a bad thing because isn't embracing opportunity being forward thinking? I mean, I use opportunity every day because chance and luck and being in the right place at the right time are incredible tools. I mean... You can be in a room with an actor and through a conversation revolutionise a costume and that's an opportunity that presents itself and you embrace it. So, yeah, I think I am ambitious and I am an opportunist and I think that ambition also is a great thing because you try harder. Like, I don't want to rest on my laurels or do the bare minimum. I want it to be better and I want it to look better and I want it to reach a certain standard. And I suppose I am ambitious in my work and I'm exacting. And some people take this very badly, but they all say they want a T-shirt in my department because I have this saying when I don't like something, I go, try harder. And they all go... That's really rude. And I go, oh, it's said in jest, really. <laughs> but, but do right? it. <laughs> but, yeah, like I don't say it meanly, but I say, uh, I think this one's a try harder. <laughs> it's meant to be funny. Some yes. people don't take it as a joke. <laughs> I, um, I've heard Baz refer to himself as being like the captain of a ship, that being the director is that kind of, of role. Are, th- are there times, Catherine, when you wish that he didn't have to be the captain but could just focus on being your partner and and the dad to your kids. It it must be challenging sometimes to share your life partner with so many other people in the way that a film director has to be. Look, absolutely, it's challenging. I mean, he, when you consider the pressures he's under, has been a really active part of our family. And He puts a lot of time into the kids and loves them to the moon and back and has always been my biggest fan and greatest supporter and is extraordinarily proud of me. So I think we've dealt with it as best we can. Does it cause tension sometimes and conflict? Yes, but my mother said to me that People that still fight 30 years after they met are likely to stay together (laughs) because they actually hash out the issues in their relationships. And, yeah, I mean, sometimes, yes. And I'm sure that I 
haven't met his expectations sometimes because I love my job, but my children have always been my priority, certainly when they were younger. So I'm sure it's frustrating sometimes too to have a partner that withholds a part of themselves in the working life to sort of nurture their children and then it's the dichotomy he wants me to do that, but at the same time, it's difficult at work. So it's a very complicated situation. But ultimately, it's just brought so much richness to our lives. I've gone on this press tour with my daughter and we're just having the best time ever. <laughs> and, you know, that comes out of a very difficult teenagehood where she didn't like me at all. I think I was the devil incarnate for a while. Are you not the coolest so, mum any teenage girl could ever have? No. I'm a tragedy. <laughs> Lily says I'm always on the edge of being cancelled for <laughs> what I say. That's one thing. I'm a musical troglodyte and I made some unfortunate hair choices recently where my hair was too fluffy. Um, <laughs> the outrageous. So, <laughs> the outrages of being a parent. But look, I have beautiful children that I'm incredibly proud of. I think both Baz and I would say they're the best thing that ever happened to us. And, you know, what a wonderful adventure. A good friend of mine, Anna Wintour, once said to me, CM, it just gets better. And I can only say that as they grow older, I just enjoy it more and more. Catherine Martin, it's been such a treat to speak with you on Conversations. Thank you so much for being my guest. You're very welcome, and I really enjoyed speaking with you today. For more like this, hit subscribe or check out the ABC Listen app for podcasts ad-free.